Good evening, everybody. Uh, uh, my name's Dr. Toby Driver from the Royal Commission in Wales, and I'll be introducing uh, Dr. Kieran Craven tonight uh, and hosting the session. I've been freezing well, my internet connection every now and then, so if I do drop out, somebody will rescue me, I'm sure. Uh, welcome tonight to uh, the Cherish webinar. Uh, Cherish is an acronym. Uh, it stands for Climate, Heritage and Environments of Reefs, Islands and Headlands. It's a joint Ireland and Wales EU funded project running for six years with four partners. In Wales, we have the Royal Commission and we have Aberystwyth University, Department of Geography and Earth Sciences. And in Ireland, we have the Discovery Programme and the Geological Survey of Ireland. Cherish about getting better data, uh, better knowledge about climate change impacts in the coastal zones, both now and past weather extremes and climate events. Uh, it's about understanding how those impacts are affecting the coast edge, a very difficult bit between the terrestrial coast edge and the maritime zone and the inshore waters. It's a great team. Uh, we do a lot of joint working, a lot of collaboration. Uh, and uh, Kieran here speaking tonight will be covering it's just some of the aspects of the project that we have going on. The lectures and webinars are organized in conjunction with the DLL Lexton Library and DLR Libraries. And we're grateful to Marianne Key, Senior Executive Librarian, for all her help and support. The Cherish exhibition was due to take place in Dunleary this week. And now we plan to reschedule that for 2021 in the library. And just to remind everybody, we have another Cherish webinar happening next week at the same time with Dr. Sandra Henry on climate change impacts on the coastal heritage of County Dublin and Sandra's from the Discovery Program. So that's uh, next week, 10th of November. So do sign up for that. Now, moving to tonight's lecture, I'd like to welcome Dr. Kieran Craven, who's going to talk tonight about lasers, drones, and boats measuring the impacts of climate change on coastal heritage. Kieran is a marine geoscientist and was appointed Cherish Project Coordinator for the Geological Survey of Ireland in 2018. He graduated with a degree in Geoscience and Environmental Biology from the University of St. Andrews in 2006 and completed a PhD in Geology from Trinity College Dublin in 2013. He's worked as a lecturer at Trinity College and Maynooth University and more recently with the Infomar programme at the GSI. And if you have questions, uh, you can type them into the side box, the question box, and we can ask those afterwards. And just to let you know, the talk is being recorded. So without further ado, Kieran, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Toby. And thank you everyone for, for joining us. Uh, I have to say, this is my, my first evening talk that I've done of, of COVID times. And I had to keep on checking myself during the day that I wasn't going to forget about it. So uh, I'm glad that's, that I, I didn't. I'm glad that I'm here and I'm glad that you've all, all made it too. And we're certainly all greatly looking forward to it. I think the return to more, more normal times. And if you haven't been to the DLR lexicon, I, I strongly urge you to when, when it reopens. It, it's a fantastic facility and are, are greatly looking forward to it uh, reopening. And as Toby said, hopefully we'll be able to be back there again soon and can continue with, with some of the, the planned events that we were hoping to, to have there. In the meantime, then I uh, want to give you a, an overview on some of the work that uh, Cherish has, has been doing. Uh, in particular, I'm working with the Geological Survey so that there'll be some emphasis on, on the work that the Geological Survey has been doing in, in Ireland. But Cherish has the, the four project partners. Uh, and again, you know, a benefit of, of these times means that uh, Toby over in Wales is able to join us and was able to, to present that. And it's definitely one of the, the key strengths of the Cherish project is to have uh, four different partners, the Royal Commission of Ancient Historical Monuments of Wales, Aberystwyth University, uh, the Discovery Programme and the Geological Survey working together to try and look at the uh, the coastline, look at the cultural heritage along the coastlines of both Ireland and Wales, and look at the impacts that climate change, uh, well, that weather events are having now, and that uh, climate change is expected to have in the future. Cherish is a six-year project. Uh, it's EU funded through the Ireland-Wales programme, and we're about halfway through that period now. And I want to start off, I guess, with two fundamental questions about sort of or that Cherish helps to, to address uh, and helps respond to. 
The first is what are the impacts of climate change around our coastlines? And the second one, which Cherish then directly tries to address, is how do we measure these? How do we record these? And then how do we um, better our understanding of cultural sites, cultural co coastal sites, um, in the face of a changing climate? So for the first question, what are the impacts of climate change on, on our coast? Have the, the three images on the left and in the talks that I've been giving um, for, for Cherish, never have to look too far for examples of the kind of impact that we are uh, expecting to experience and expecting to experience more frequently in the face of a climate change, of a changing climate. So the top and bottom image there is just taken a few days ago in Cork. This was the, the recent storms that, that we have uh, where with strong winds pushing up the water along the south coast of Ireland, uh, high rainfall coming down, down the river leads to increased coastal flooding. You then also have the likes of sea level rise, predicted sea level rise, which will then make this problem worse. And we're then expecting to see coastal flooding like we've, we've recently experienced becoming more frequent. And this will then impact the coast just through the elevated water at the time of flooding, but also it exasperates the, the issues of wave action, uh, of storm events as all that water is pushing closer and closer to the, the coastline up against you know, our, our cliff faces, our natural barriers to, to the sea. And then there's increased um, erosion, increased sediment transport is then occurring there. So there's certainly some of the, the main issues is the, the sea level rise and, and storms. And that centre picture there is, this was taken a few months ago, that's actually uh, when it was Hurricane Lorenzo last year, I think uh, the first Category 5 hurricane that we'd seen in the, the Northeast Atlantic. Luckily, by the time it hit Ireland, it was only Storm Lorenzo. Um, but these are the, the kind of thing that, that we expect to see more frequently. And these then impacts that we're getting along our coast will have a profound influence on the, the cultural heritage sites along our coastline. And this is specifically then what Cherish is trying to look at and trying to, to address. And while we, we develop methodologies and, and we continue to develop methodologies to look at the impact of climate change to cultural sites, what we're developing is not restricted to cultural sites. It can also be used in other applications. It can be used for normal coastal defense by local authorities um, and for preserving other uh, important and significant sites or, or coastal areas that we have. So where are we then looking and where is Cherish focusing its attention? It is along the, the east and the south coast of Ireland in about five different key locations that were selected based on their cultural heritage, uh, sites of, of specific interest, but also have a whole range of different environments. Some of them are hard rock, some are soft rock, some are more exposed to, to prevailing wind than other. So we have a whole range of very different environments that we're then able to look at and, and assess and trial our different methodologies. We also have a, a number of sites over in Wales and through um, cross-border collaboration, uh, teams of, of our Welsh partners comes over to Ireland and we have then gone over to, to Wales uh, too and we share our expertise, share our knowledge and sort of like increase the, the discussion of what is going on at these sites in both Ireland and Wales. Moving on to the methodologies that we're then, then applying, and this is what most of the talk is, is going to be, be looking at, is some of the different suites of technology, um, some of it new, some of it very old, um, and how do we, we apply that in the coastal zone, learning about the cultural heritage, but also understanding the regional context that these sites sit in. And if I then take this image and I'll start offshore um, and move way, way onshore, we have uh, and are conducting kind of underwater surveys of shipwrecks, both through divers, but also using existing uh, expertise and, and knowledge within the geological survey from the, the marine mapping program and um, to get accurate bathymetry, which is like the, the seafloor topography um, of, the, of the area. 
Now, these technologies and these methodologies can only work so far. Uh, they're constrained by the existence of, of water and where the water gets too shallow, you're not able to use these methodologies. So in areas that we can't apply them, we're using other um, technologies. And in the intertidal zone, we will be using things like uh, terrestrial laser scanners, which are able to accurately uh, record multiple points along a, a surface and record those points in three-dimensional space. Um, so each point has a, has a known location. And we're able to augment that and, and increase the coverage of using drones that can fly over a sort of like a, a scale of hundreds of meters to, to kilometers, um, take photos of that coastal zone and from those produce three-dimensional models of what that surface looks like now. Further inland is, is where you know our, our colleagues over in uh, over in Wales, our colleagues in the Discovery Program are able to apply their archaeological uh, methodologies and, and understandings in using um, geophysical methodologies to, in a non-invasive way, understand more about the archaeology that's uh, existing at the site, the subsurface archaeology that, that's there. We're able to do um, scans and surveys of, of the buildings. Uh, we're able to do perhaps geological and um, more analysis work on uh, external cliffs. We're able to take cores from these sites and from that know more perhaps about the long-term environmental records at these these sites to uh, to put them in context to the, of the long-term picture uh, going forward. And then using more aerial um, techniques, we can have uh, airborne LIDAR that's able to, to record the, the topography of coastlines from a plane. We're able to use aerial photography for, again, um, sort of like um, in-depth analysis of sites, getting that regional picture. And we also use satellites to, to analyze the, the much larger, the, the regional scale of, of it. And the real kind of strength and, and the real innovation of, of the Cherish project is then merging all these very disparate methodologies to understand and to record our coastlines and our changing coastlines. And over the next few series of slides, then I'm going to show some of the ways that we do that and some of the data that we are, are getting as a result and where we're able to apply it and perhaps where we aren't able to apply it. So when I talk about surveying an area uh, and, and how we go out there, there's a range of scales of which we can, can look at that that particular site. And, and these range from the, the kilometre scale, uh, using techniques like our, our airborne LIDAR, using our, our drone surveys, uh, we're able to get a, a three-dimensional picture of kilometre stretches. And, and those of you looking from, from Dublin might recognise this area here. It's a, a recent survey that Cherish did in, in Dublin Bay. And we surveyed the, the intertidal zone from Irish Town. Um, there near the, the pigeon house and the, uh, the incinerator from a leg called an, an incinerator um, from that sort of like western side right the way through to, to Dunleary. So we're talking about five or six kilometer kind of like stretch of coastline. And we're able to then go from that scale to this image down here in the, the bottom right, which is of one eroding cliff at uh, Braymore Head in North County Dublin where we used our terrestrial laser scanner to uh, record the, the area where active erosion was occurring in very, very high density. And we're only talking about maybe four or five meters across, but we were able to get points every two millimeters or, or so. So we're going right from a, a scale of observation on, you know, from six to eight kilometers, right down to the, the meter scale and everything in, in between to, maybe understand the, the larger processes that are occurring at the site by using our kilometer scale data to looking at very, very specific parts of a site to better understand what is happening at that location. This is just another example of the maybe the, the, the larger scale that we're able to, to look at. This is a site in Balance Skelligs down in County Kerry where over three days uh, we went down and, and using our drone 
mapped the entire coastline along there. I think it's about eight kilometers uh, in, in total. And that took us about three days. And, and really that's about the, the maximum um, distance that, that we're kind of like able to survey uh, efficiently. Beyond that, you're looking at, at other techniques and, and it turns into more regional or, or national scales. Um, but Cherish is, is much more focused at, at the site to, to local, the, the kind of like hundreds of meters to, to kilometer scale areas of, of coastal locations. What are the kind of products that we're able to, to produce? And, you know, starting off, uh, and certainly what the, the geological survey is, is interested in and, and, and are, are providing to our, our project partners are these uh, local models of what the surface looks like now. And this is really the, the first point for understanding climate change is knowing what's there at the moment. It, it's establishing a baseline. What does the coastline look like now? So that when you return at any point in the future and you're able to then assess how it has changed from that baseline. And then the third step, which is really the most critical step is why has it changed? So you always want to know what there is now, what has changed when you return, and then why it's changed. And, and that's ultimately what Cherish is, is trying to, to get to. And certainly over the, the first two or three years, what we've been focusing in, what we need to focus in is establishing that baseline. And so I have some examples here of, of what that means. And, and this is using our, our drone surveys. Um, in North County Dublin is the first one that this is Braymore. We have a 16th century harbor and um, that Cherish is, is interested in. There's also some megalithic tombs in, in the region. But we're interested in particularly what's happening around this harbour here, but we're also giving the, the regional picture uh, over about a kind of like two kilometre scale, what it looks like to then maybe understand some of the um, hydrodynamic processes that, that are occurring um, in that location. Similarly, this is uh, Dramana, just north of Rush. And again, using our, our drone, we, we extended it down further um, to, to get that baseline status of what the coastline looks like and, and these are particularly important for maybe understanding the impacts of flooding uh, what are the low areas versus what are, are the high areas and from that understanding where the impacts of sea level rise where you're going to have increased work to increase storm surges and increased flooding where are the most vulnerable locations in those cherished sites so that's the the baseline study we're then able to get that data and we're able to combine them with other sources. Some of them are existing, some of them are, are derived. So as an example, again, this is Braymore Head in County Dublin. This is the, the UAV model that, that we produce. And, and this one we only flew about three or four weeks ago. So it's still relatively, relatively new. But we're able to um, combine it with other data sets that already exist. And so this one here, colored red, is the geology of the area, which is a, a volcanic rock type that, that in many places is quite hard wearing and quite resistant. Uh, so that perhaps will give us some indication of, you know, what processes that, that we might expect to be most dominant in these areas or what processes might not um, be quite so important and you know when you're talking about hard areas hard rock areas and um, you know erosion tends to be one of the the smaller you know it, it might be, be diminished but so we're able to get perhaps some semblance of, of, of an understanding but by, by looking at existing data and um, the second one is the the quaternary area of it that the recent sediments and, and from this the gray is exposed bedrock so we see right away around this this headland here there's already exposed rock which could be acting as a, um, as a protection to the, the sediment and the sites within it. We're also able to, to take our elevation model and derive other products from that. And an example of this one here is, is slope. So we're able to, in uh, software packages, um, calculate the, the slope of individual surfaces and you know where we have high slope could be areas where we have cliffs and so we can start from our model maybe start interpreting what's there and in this instance here all the red is very very, very high slope so it, it picks up a cliff line along here uh, it also picks up the hedgerows 
in in the area um, for, further up. So uh, you always have to be be aware of what you're you're looking at and, and what you're, you're recording. What we're also trying to do at this baseline stage is integrate the the technologies and some of the the methodologies that we apply can be extremely good at looking at one particular area and um, drones for instance because the the drone flies backwards and forwards the camera faces down it's very good at taking you know the the photos of, of flat lying surfaces and building a model of of the kind of relatively flat or, or, or undulating surface it's not quite so good on vertical surfaces. You know, it, it does produce data, but you frequently sometimes get uh, blank spots from that because as the drone flow, flies over, it doesn't get a clear picture of that vertical face. But bringing a laser scanner into it and being positioning a laser scanner on the foreshore and then recording what's there behind it gives you a very, very good and clear picture of that vertical surface. And we've trialed bringing these two uh, data sets together and why you always have to be cautious brings us together on the whole that works extremely well and so we're able to maybe fill in gaps or, or look at areas in, in more detail by combining the technologies as opposed to using each one individually and just some examples of, of numbers from this for, for those of you that, that could be interested using our, our drone uh, we generate a, a point density that's a, sorry, a point of you know known coordinates and also a known height of it. And uh, our drone will collect about a thousand points per square meter. Whereas with our, our terrestrial laser scanner, we can have say up to 160,000 points per meter squared. So you can have different orders of magnitude of the amount of data that you're able to, to collect. So you're able to then tailor the way you use your methodologies to address maybe different situations or, or different questions that, that you might want answered from, from individual sites. This again, just an example of um, superimposing the, uh, the laser scanner, which is the, the very, very clear picture. This is actually uh, all points, but what they're called, the density is so, uh, so high that it looks like it's the full picture compared to individual points from the drones. And, and this picture just uh, is there to illustrate that you're able to get maybe much more data from one methodology as opposed to another methodology. We've then taken this and we, we've applied it uh, in various locations. This is uh, an area in um, Wexford's Kilmichael Point where there's a, an old Coast Guard station, there's an old boat shed, and there's a probably a, a promontory fort that's sitting on, on one side. So again, using our, our UAV, we're able to generate a, a three-dimensional model of that whole area. But in specific locations where we have particular interest of, of what's going on, such as the, um, the boat shed um, that's there that, that, that's eroding, we set up our laser scanner along the beach and on, on the cliff faces and have then a very, very accurate and um, densely populated point cloud of this one that would then be able to pick up individual rocks and stones and bits of debris. And then when we return, we might be able to assess how that has changed. And then that leads into the question of why that's changed, what processes are, are, are occurring. And in this one uh, slide as well, I, I've included uh, very recently with the, the assistance and, and the support of Dunia Rathdown County Council, we did a, a drone survey of Dorky Island and again have the, the baseline survey of Dorky Island, which has, has a very rich cultural history to it, to assess any future change, you know, both within the, the lifetime of, of the project, which is going to run for another three years, but particularly in situations like Dorky Island, that's very hard rock areas, it's a, a granite rock that, that formed it. We're talking about the long-term change, so that the, the data that we're producing now should still be able to, to be used in um, kind of like 30, 40 years time or, or even more and um, to, to understand what, what is happening. We're also integrating technologies um, in different environments. So the examples, but before of the uh, the drone data with the uh, the laser scanner was all terrestrial. We're applying it in the marine realm as well, and and trying to stitch together the marine realm with the, the terrestrial realm. And we in the geological survey have been over to Wales, I think three times now with uh, our vessels and based on the, the recommendations and the requirements of, of our Welsh colleagues are targeting specific sites of interest 
and then generating new maps of the sea floor. This is around Puffin Island here um, to the northeast of Anglesey, just where the, the Menai Straits um, are kind of like open up. Um, and we are then combining, and this is have combined the, the bathymetric map, the, the sea floor, um, with the LIDAR data, which was commissioned by the, the Royal Commission in Wales. And so that's taking our, our terrestrial data by our partners, the marine data by, by ourselves, and merging those together to get a seamless onshore, offshore map. Because what is impacting these sites, and there is uh, an old church and, and other cultural sites on, on this island, isn't restricted to either the terrestrial realm or the marine. It, it's linked together. It is the, the weather events, the rainfalls, the, uh, the storms, the strong winds that, that are occurring on the island, linked in with the water currents and the waves and the, the storm surges that, that are happening in the marine. And by, by combining the, these two areas, help us to greater understand the context of these sites and therefore the processes that are occurring at these sites. And so really help us to, to understand that the hydrodynamic processes, which are perhaps controlling some of the, uh, the, the terrestrial processes. Another example, this one also from Wales, this is uh, one of the, the key chair sites. It's Dinis Dintley, a promontory fort in, uh, in North Wales, and um, has been surveyed using drones and terrestrial aid scanners to get that baseline study. This year, we also headed up and um, the vessels surveyed the offshore area from that, and we will be looking to, to stitch these two together to again produce one of our seamless onshore offshore maps of the promontory fort running into the, um, the coastal, coastal zone. There has also been uh, geophysical um, techniques and methodologies applied to understand or, or to try and re reveal some of the, of the subsurface uh, features within this fort. And, they have uh, produced what is a, a very, or shown to be a, a very densely populated site with, uh, with many structures within it and um, round circular houses, or the bases of round circular houses and other features that, that are, are in there. There has also been analysis of, of the, the eroding cliff face um, after a, a high magnitude rainfall event and there was a, a, a collapse on one side up high, which was then revealed the, the sediment and, and the structure behind it. So members of the Cherish team were able to, to go out there and assess the, the, kind, the kind of sediments that are there and understanding that the processes that are leading to, to the erosion of, of the site, which isn't just stuff coming from the base. It's not just your wave action eroding the base. It's also water that is then flowing through the sediment itself and it is concentrating along lines of um, less permeable uh, sediment, so clay-rich lenses and layers within the site, and that's where we're getting and seeing our, our active er erosion. And so we're, we're understanding that by, by being able to look at it from a regional picture down to a local picture. We've also um, commissioned um, community excavation. Involved digging two trenches, crooks the eroding cliff line, and to try and capture material before it got lost to to the uh, the processes, the, the erosion processes, um, and from Aberystwyth University, looking at the the sand deposits that overlie a lot of these these sites, and and taking discrete layers, and then being able to date those to try and and, and understand what processes might have led to the abandonment of this site um, there. And so, you know, that's drawing on the expertise of all the different project partners to try and look at and understand one site. And then we're trying to replicate that in other sites, both in Wales and in Ireland. So a lot of that that I've covered now is, is about establishing that, that baseline. And what I'm going to move on now to is looking at then, okay, how do we quantify change or how do we understand change at these sites? And this is Dunbeg in, in County Kerry. This was uh, flown by our colleagues in the, in the Discovery Programme in June 2017 and again in April 2018. So about one year in between. And in that intervening year, 
there was a, a large collapse on, on one side that uh, led some of the the um, the outer wall or, or the inner walls as I might be corrected by a, by an archaeologist uh, led to that collapse down into it and lost about I think it was about 30,000 meters cubed uh, of material from that site. Um, not only did that happen in one year, it can be tied to a, a high magnitude rainfall event. It was a storm that, that passed by. And again, it was actually processes occurring inland that led to the, the erosion and the change that we then saw at this coastal site. So while you might have your waves that are then producing your, your vertical cliff face, frequently it's actually what is happening in, inland, which is then impacting it. And, to quantify change, we're, we're uh, able to look back at uh, the old maps um, and maybe chart where that cliff line is over successive years to see that, that, that there has been change over the, the last kind of like 100, 120 years. And that's you know one way that we're able to, to quantify change. But through the development of, of chairs, we're also able to apply um, other um, techniques. And so this again is uh, comparing old maps with, with what's happening now. This is a Kilmichael point, um, showed an image of, of that area with the Coast Guard station. Uh, this is the, the old 1840s map of, of the area, which uh, the green line here shows where, where the coastline was uh, in the 1840s. This blue line is where it is now. So we've, we've seen several hundred meters of, uh, of erosion during that uh, intervening 150 years. And the erosion rate is anywhere from about uh, 10 centimeters a year uh, up in, in this area to up to two meters a year is the average long-term rate um, occurring, occurring here. And similarly in, in Portran, comparing the, the old maps with, uh, with what is currently there, uh, you can have upwards of like uh, 100, 110 meters of, of accretion in, in the northern part and about 50 meters of, of erosion. And so that's that's one way of, of quantifying change. Another way is using the, the methodologies that, that we're applying to, to perhaps look at change on, on a smaller scale or a smaller temporal scale. So two events that are, are close to another, can we identify and pick up change? And we surveyed Kilmichael Point and Kilpatrick Beach in, in 2019 but the landowner in this area had actually commissioned his own survey in 2016, his own drone survey, and made that data available to us. And, and that allows us to do a, a comparison. And so in, in this map here, we're actually comparing the, the model or the, you know, what the land surface looks like in 2019 compared with what the land surface was like in 2016. And it's been color coded. So areas of red mean that there's been um, like erosion the, the land surface has decreased and areas of blue is where there's been accretion or the land level is, has increased. And if we look down in, in this area here, which is the, the southern part of it, at, at the north end of Kilpatrick Beach, for anyone that, that, that knows the, the region, uh, we're seeing in, in, in an area of the sand dunes, a real focus of erosion happening in, in this one, one case where all the red is, is erosion and along the, the sand dunes on, on the side. And we're ready to put numbers on that. So in the, the three years um, between the, the two surveys in this area and here, there's been about 4,500 meters cubed of material removed from that, that area. We're ready to take that, that same approach and, and apply it in different areas. And, and this is coming back to Braymore Head there in, in um, County Dublin. Um, I showed some images beforehand that, that had the, the geology, that, that hard geology in the area, and, and we surveyed the area in 2019. We returned there about three, four weeks ago, surveyed it in, in 2020. And again, this is a, um, a, a model of the difference between those two, where, where blue is where the land level has increased or there's been accretion, and, and red is where there's, there's been erosion. And it can be impacted by stuff like what's growing in the field. There was maize in this field here, so the maize is, is very high, so you know this is a blue. These individual spots are individual hay bales. So again, they stand up compared to what we'd surveyed the year before, you get a strong blue. And um, the red is to do with the tides, uh, the tide level was, was different. 
So I want to focus in in a very specific area, which is this kind of line that focuses around here. And, and this is the, the cliff face where it runs across. And these are still very, very early results. So we we'll want to, to kind of like refine them more. But again, we're able to see that some of the reds are concentrated in certain areas. That, that overall in this area in brain war, there maybe hasn't been that much change in a year, but in certain areas in these kind of like eroding faces is where we're seeing and where we're able to capture ongoing erosion and then we're able to then take this technique and apply it in in other areas or allow landowners themselves to then apply these these kind of techniques to understand what's going on uh, in in the the regions this is just a, a third example this this is down in wexford where we have a, a time series near ross lair it was flown in 2017 and 2018 and 2019 um, and again red is erosion and blue is deposition so the first image here, uh, D, is the difference between 2017 and 2018. This is 2018 to 2019. And then F is the, the, the total difference, the, the, the difference between 2017 and 2019. And so what we're able to see, see from this is that erosion isn't uniform at all. We seem to have had much more erosion between 2018 and 2019 than we did between 2017 and, and 2018. Um, we can also see perhaps that uh, erosion is moving northwards along the, the cliff face, that, that while it was focused kind of like then in the, the southern area, it's being pushed northwards. And so again, building up a picture of what is going on in the area, what has changed, to then try and understand why it has changed. And when we take that understanding and apply it to a, a cultural site, we then use that information to be okay. So then how do we best protect this site against further change? How, what measures do you want to put in place to, to try and preserve um, the, these sites as long as possible or, or as much as possible? We don't just apply this to the coastal sections where we're also looking at uh, shipwrecks. This, this is the part where the, where the boats come into it. Um, the, the Manchester Merchant is a, a vessel that was built in 1900s. I think as soon as it was built, it was requisitioned by the, the British Army and was used to move um, troops, ammunition, horses and supplies down to South Africa for the, the Boer War. And as soon as that was no longer used, needed, it came, came back to Europe. It was on its first voyage post its, uh, its wartime exploit and it sank. Um, it sank uh, in Dingle Harbour. It was carrying a, a, a cargo of cotton and I think turpentine. And, and I believe one led to the combustion of, of the other. Um, the, the captain had to bring the ship into to Dingle Bay. It, it stayed there for about a day and then they had to abandon it and the, the ship sank. And so it's in about 14 metres of water in Dingle Bay. We've gone and we surveyed it. Um, it was surveyed in 2009 with the Infomar survey. That's the, um, the national seabed mapping survey um, it, in Ireland. So it was picked up then. As part of Cherish, we returned and we surveyed it in 2019. And this is the, the image that it is now. Uh, and we were able to compare the two of them, similar to what we've done in, in our coastal areas, is, is look at the change that has happened between in that 10 years. And the different colors respond to the, the elevation change where uh, in the center, we have up to, to four meters elevation change in around the boilers where perhaps they're beginning to disintegrate and, and, and fall off. Um, but concentrated around the bow and the stern, we have up to half a meter of, of elevation change in that, that sediment. And, this can be a, as a result of uh, the water flow being focused around either the stern or the bow of, of the vessel. And so understanding then that the processes that are, are impacting this hidden heritage uh, or, or this difficult to access heritage allows us to, to understand um, you know, how they'll respond to increased storm events or higher flow velocities will lead you know, to probably greater disintegration of, of these important sites. 
What's also interesting about shipwrecks is, is they're frequently used as natural uh, analogs to um, what will happen to wind turbines. So wind turbines are attached to the seabed. They create an obstruction in the seabed, the same as, as a shipwreck does. So the, the kind of thing that, that, that occur to shipwrecks will also occur to the bases of, of wind turbines. So you can take lessons learned from, from this kind of work and apply it to, to what will happen to uh, renewable energy or, or other infrastructure in the marine world. So we've done that in, um, in Dingle to, to the, the Manchester Merchant. We also are, are building up a picture for the, the City of London, which is a, a wreck there near Kilmore Quay in County Wexford. It was surveyed in 2015 as part of Infomar. It was surveyed again in 2018 as part of Cherish. And we've got it again in 2020 again as part of Cherish. And you know, from this one, we're looking forward to bringing it into our, our um, software package to, to compare elevation differences because it was exposed in 2015. It was largely covered in 2018 back in 2020 it's been exposed again so we're, we're really beginning to build a picture of the dynamic nature of this um coastal of, of this uh, i won't say intertidal because this, this is just just below the intertidal but, but our, the shallow marine environment uh, very very changeable um, that that's going there and cherish is helping to kind of elucidate this re reveal this and get quantitative information quantitative data on what's going on in these these areas um I'm going to finish up on a couple more slides. This one kind of takes a, a bigger picture and, and it was because it, it's something that, that we, we've trialed. Um, it's again, integrating a, a very different technology that this is satellite. And it was um, a, a project that, that we, we tried to do and that you know, has applications um, to, to understanding on, on a regional scale, the, the bathymetry and it's using satellite images, just a, a normal photograph taken from space uh, on a day where there is no cloud, uh, on a day where there isn't much turbidity in the, in the sea, they're, they're uh, few and far to, to, uh, to get, uh, but you're able to get some nice satellite photos of different stretches of the coastline. And from that, um, work out what the bathymetry is. And, and it works to about 10 meters or so. And these dots along here are where we, we've uh, driven the vessel, where we've got accurate bathymetry using the vessel. And these are then used to, to validate and to, to train our satellite derived bathymetry. But, but using this ray to pick up maybe some of, some of the larger scale features that are, are occurring. And a great benefit of, of satellite derived bathymetry is it really is able to use and, and pushed in where you have shallow water. Shallow water is very, very difficult to, to monitor because it's too shallow for the boats to get up to, but it's also covered by water. So your drones that, that come down don't reach as, as far down and, and can't get that critical information from this band of very, very shallow water. So we've trialed using uh, satellite images to, to try and plug that gap and maybe stitch in between our, our high resolution drone data or high resolution uh, bathymetry data from, from vessels and to have that, um, that satellite bathymetry that, that fills that gap, that so-called white ribbon, which helps us to build our seamless maps to understand the processes. Uh, so we're about halfway through um, the, the project uh, as a whole, we're coming to the end of the talk. Um, we are, have established baseline data in a lot of places. We're now shifting that focus to, to looking at that change, quantifying and, and measuring that, that change. But we're also looking to the, to the future and what Cherish is going to, to leave behind. And we're, we're very keen that the, the data that we produce doesn't just sit on servers within the individual organizations. We are um, actively trying to, to make connections with, with the local stakeholders, local interest groups, um, local authorities that can use the data. And a, an example of, of that is that the Dorky Island data, uh, which we've collected, and, and that's being given to Dunleary Rathdown County Council, and that is being used by their biodiversity officer and their heritage officer to understand um, the, you know, what's going on. It can be used to, to help identify uh, sites that, that nesting birds will, will use or, or different environments that, that, that are in there. So, so this data is freely available um, and is, um, is getting released and, uh, and will be released through portals, both in, in the, the Cherish organization and our, our partner, partner or organizations. We are 
developing um, the best practice guidance uh, for the different methodologies that, that we use. So using the lessons that, that we learn in these cultural sites, developing the, these booklets that will be provided to local authorities or landowners or other interest groups that help to, to describe and recommend what techniques can be used in, in different areas and, and how to apply the, the methodologies that, that we're currently applying. Uh, alongside that, there's going to be management plans to the, uh, the landowners or, or, or the caretakers, the, the curators of, of a lot of these sites to, to help preserve them um, long term and, and in the face of, of a climate change um, climbing, changing climate. Uh, we are, are trying to deal with, with coastal communities and feed into the, the, the blue economy and, and, and help to sort of like um, increase awareness uh, and understanding of the, the benefits of our, our coastal sites. So I will leave it at that. I'll say thank you very much for, for your time uh, and your patience and, and uh, happy to take questions. But again, I'll also remind you that uh, Sandra Henry from the Discovery Programme is giving a talk in a week's time at uh, seven o'clock uh, again on, on Tuesday. And so hopefully you, you've enjoyed this and, and hopefully you will attend for that one too. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Kieran. That's absolutely wonderful. Um, we've had a, a huge uh, range of technologies uh, being demonstrated to us. Uh, combining technologies over so many types, drones, boats, satellites, uh, ground laser scanning uh, and so on, and bring that joint nation uh, element as well, sharing that, that same best practice across the ocean as well. <clears throat> Interesting to see the quantity of erosion at Braymore uh, that you were talking about, uh, quite dramatic, but also the accretion as well as the, the erosion uh, at Wexford. Um, we've uh, got some questions in, so I shall, without further ado, direct them to the person who'll know, uh, our speaker. Um, so I'll uh, first, I'd like to bring in uh, Aidan Gibbons' question. Uh, have you collected any data on the Health Peninsula in North Dublin, in particular the promontory fort at Dungriffin and Bailey Lighthouse? No, uh, is, is the short answer to, to that one. Um, there, there's certainly a, a lot of sites that, that we would have liked to have in, included, but based on, on the, the time constraints that we have for, for this project, um, we have... We have Leave, leave areas and some important areas off. Uh, so that's that's not one of the, the areas that I believe that we are, are looking at. We are, are looking at it, it comes out at, at about 20 sites around around Ireland and a similar one in, in Wales. And we've had to, to be very careful that we haven't spread ourselves too thin in, in it. Now the hope of, of Cherish is that there will be, you know, as part of, of the legacy, that there'll be the opportunity to expand the areas in, in, into other uh, other places uh, and other stretches. So while we're not able to, to look at, at it now, uh, you know, it's the kind of thing that, that we, we would hope that areas like that we'll be able to look at in the future. Excellent. Yeah, I know we did some uh, low level aerial photography last March over the house into but that's only a few photographs, but just to sort of show current condition, but no detailed data gathering. Uh, thank you. The next question is from Helen Murray. Are there any insights uh, with vertical datums at the land-sea interface? Um, I know vertical datums are one of those puzzling things, aren't they? Well, I find them puzzling anyway. Any insights gained from your uh, detailed work at the land-sea interface about datums? Um, not, not really. We haven't been been addressing kind of like issue, issues like that. Um, certainly, I mean, it's 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 a whole whole issue of. Uh, on its own is, is is what datum um do do you use or 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 do you do you apply so no we haven't been, been dealing with that kind of a of an aspect um the you know what what we're interested in and, and what we, we've been focusing our, our efforts in is to measure the, the sites to one particular datum and so coming from a, a marine background and, and you know coming from the the unit within geological survey we would measure everything uh, of ours to um, LAT is, is the, the vertical datum that that we use that that's lowest astronomical tide we would also tie it into the the ordnance survey uh, OD Malin 
um, from it, and, and and from that you just do do vertical shifts to to other datums. But but they are are the two that that we are predominantly focus on in Ireland. And then when we go over to to Wales, then we would we would try and level either again to to LAT, which is, is modelled by the the UK Hydro, Hydrographic Office. Uh, and we would use British National Grid um, for, for those ones. So, so we would just focus on, on two of those um, because yeah, otherwise it, it can get quite complex. Excellent. We have uh, some questions coming as well about data accessibility uh, and, and how people can get their hands on all the data, which is uh, certainly something people are going to be aspiring to. Uh, I'll take them in turn. Uh, Dave uh, has asked, are the collected data, especially detailed topography, readily accessible? I know from the archaeological side that uh, we have a Sketchfab account. If you've not used Sketchfab before, you can search for Cherish Sketchfab uh, and all these amazing rotatable 3D models pop up on your web browser from Ireland and Wales, a, a lot of the new surveys we've been doing. So that's one way people can certainly get their data tonight if they want to have a look at it. Uh, any other ideas there, Kieran? Yeah, no, certainly the... Uh, Sketchfab has been one that, that a lot of the partner organizations have, have used, the, the Cherish one, and the individual partners have their own ones. So the Scobie program has one, and Geological Survey ha has one as well, and, and they have models from Cherish and from uh, other areas as well, or, or other projects. So I definitely recommend Sketchfab. We are looking to um, ensuring the, the long-term availability of these and the, the Geological Survey Ireland hosts a, a, an online topographic viewer that currently has LIDAR data in there and, and they're actually increasing that there's, there's a lot of OPW data is being incorporated in, into that. Soon, uh, within the next, let's say, six months, we're, we're looking at, at hosting our, um, hosting our, um, our, our drone, our UAV data in that viewer. So it, it will also be available um, there as well. And so again, kind of like watch, watch this space, uh, keep an eye on the, the Cherish website, on, on the Twitter and Facebook. And we, we are working towards um, getting all of the data that, that we collect um, out freely available to, to those that want us. Yeah, I know our colleague Anthony Corns is currently working on a new version of the website, hopefully ready before Christmas. And that's where we're going to be putting a lot of our full reports, big PDF documents of all the, all the surveys that we've been doing over the last couple of years. We have them on our computers, but they now need to be shared more publicly. Uh, we're not let off the hook yet here. We've got a few questions to go through here. Um, Dominic Robinson is pleased to be able to attend the talk by Heritage Maps platform. And he's got a couple of questions as well about uh, the availability of data in geospatial format. He asks, uh, what's the role of GIS in the analysis of datum, of the datum? Uh, does it help to marry different types of data and technologies? Uh, is there a plan to publish raw data in any format? And also, how are we assessing the built heritage? I can tuck in on that at the end. But firstly, yeah, uh, what's the role of GIS in combining technologies, and, and is there a plan to publish the raw data in any format? Yes, um, certainly GIS is huge. Um, very much, it, it's the the first part of of call that that we use. That once the the data is collected and and, and processed in into a a three D model, uh, we would use GIS to um, spatially locate that and also create derivatives. So stuff like that slope profile was used using GIS to to calculate further information from, from these models. So you're also able to uh, produce like um, topographic. And um, indexes as well. So, so, so look at, at, at mounds and ridges compared to, to valleys and, and troughs and, and understand and a uh, landforms from that. In terms of integrating the, the, the technologies, um, GIS, while what, what it, it can work, we, we've been using other um, processes or, or other software because they're, they're slightly better currently at, at the moment. So, so we would use proprietary software for like merging our um, our point clouds, our, our laser scanner with our drone stuff. So, so we use a lot of Trimble gear. So we have Trimble Business Center, which is quite expensive for, for the normal consumer to, to merge those. But we're also using um, a, a, very, a free software, Cloud Compare is, is, is extremely good for, for merging different point clouds as well. But that's really available. We, we use that for, for doing like comparisons of, of point clouds. So GIS is, is extremely important, very important, but we're also then using additional software to um, tag tag in, into that. I think the, the second part of the question was, was it raw data availability? 
yeah yeah we are we we, we do have to be careful particularly with, with the drone data because we're taking photographs while it uh, doesn't necessarily it might not be um interpreted as personal data because you can't actually recognize anybody it's um it's 100 meters um up when it takes pictures and, and the pixel size you can't recognize it we are conscious of gdpr and, and people's right to privacy so, you know, using a drone survey, the raw data from that will be photographs. And, and we've currently made, made the decision that, that we're not releasing the photographs um, to, to the general public, um, whereas we will deliver the, the derived products. And so that's our three dimensional model of, of the drone stuff is available. So, you know, if, if, if you count that as a raw product because, it, because it's the primary derived product, then, then yes, we make that available. We would make the point cloud from that available. The actual photos, we wouldn't. From the so like a, a laser scanner, um, the the point cloud that, that we, we produce, we would likely um, clip the excess noise around it. So we do some cleaning, but then that will be be available from it. And we're always open to, to lines of, of communication. So if there's a specific need for somebody for, for the raw data, while it might, might not be freely available in the first instance, uh, if we're able to be, be contacted it, and you know the, the long term um, part of the project would, would also allow for this raw data would be available provided it didn't breach any GDP or etc as, as we'd have to be careful of and then Toby I might let you jump in on that third one that's good yeah uh, so far Dominic asked to have our assessment of built heritage historical buildings townhouses for example or tower houses uh, and one of the key things about Cherish is it principally focused on the, the islands and the headlands the more remote stretches of the Irish and Welsh coastline where the data is porous where people haven't been, and the map makers have sometimes you know, given up getting an accurate model. So actually, we're dealing with some very remote sites, not really the towns and the, the hard coastal infrastructure. Uh, but we're certainly in Ireland working at places like Clon Mines uh, in Wexford, Island of the Skelligs, uh, the uh, building there on the, the coast, and in, our, in Wales, we're dealing with some remote churches and so on, on um, uh, islands like Puffin Island. And a lot of the approach there will be, as Kieran has assessed and has talked tonight, it's about getting that millimetre accurate model of those buildings. It's banking that data. What's the building condition now? So that we can measure uh, adverse effects of erosion and collapse and, and change over the next 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. So that's, you yeah, know, it's about making that detailed baseline record where we have those buildings in our study areas. Can I direct a couple of more questions on to you, please, Kieran? Mm -hmm. uh, Marion uh, says, great talk. And can you comment further on the situation at Dorky Island? Has there been much erosion of late there? Is it secure geologically? Uh, fantastic to see that Dorky Island data. Uh, real, real one, nice model. Certainly. Um, so currently, we're not able to assess, assess change. That that what we we're able to do and what we we're able to fly was the the baseline survey. Now, what we will hope to do, uh, but we haven't had had an opportunity to to yet, and haven't quite got the, the source data yet for it, but I believe there is LiDAR data of Dorky Island that was taken some, some years ago. So we, we hope to be able to compare what we have now to what was there previously. Um, and, and then we'll be able to make some kind of assessment of change. My feeling would, would be that there wouldn't be much change, that yes, geologically speaking, Dorky Island is very stable. It, it's the granite rock, it's, it's the granite that forms the, the high point of, of Kalini Hill. Um, it, it would be expected to, to be, be quite stable. Erosion rates will, will be low, um, but that's in, in a general sense. Yeah, some parts of, of it will be quite exposed to, to easterly winds, um, and you know it'd be interesting to see that there's a lot of boulders around, you know, um, parts of, of Bucky Island, and you know there's been work done on, on the west coast um, where they they've looked at, at huge, massive boulders like 20 meters across. That are able to be moved significant distances like 30 40 meters in storm events so e even in areas where we you know we would expect there to be not much change when you get a particular storm and um, you know and, and the conditions are, are right a lot of change can happen even in stable um areas so it, it will be be very interesting i think to see the changes but in in the long term Dorky island isn't going anywhere uh, at, at all that's uh that, that no it, it is very strong that's good to know uh we have another question from uh, neil uh here uh, who asks for surveys that stretches over several kilometers is the project using rtk or ppk drones to cut down on gcp field work 
Yeah. Uh, and it is also curious as to whether for our logical work, if GPR, ground penetrating radar, is integrate, integrated with GPS. Uh, and are there, are there other instruments being used? I know we've been using GPR in Wales at Dina Sintley, Sumo survey, did a GPR survey of the Hillport, they were the great results. Yeah. Kieran, on that, on that matter of RTK and PPK. RTK and PPK. So, um, yeah, very, very good question. Um, very, very sort of like um, technically you know minded and, and, and to the point we use rtk and um, so for, for people who are, are kind of like not know that there's a lot of three-letter acronyms and, and everything it, it, it's how your drone connects to the, the satellites and how it knows its position um, and and we we use rtk for the ease of it that that you do lose some precision um as, as a result of that but um in terms of, of what we're interested in, which is the the relative position of, of the sort of like you know points along along the coastline, uh, we're happy using RTK, which significantly increases our ability to cover a stretch of area and to process that data to, to generate our products relatively quickly. Uh, we did start off using PPK, and, and then there's some instances where our our RTK has has lost, but where we have done done PPK processing. But uh, just in terms of, of trying to at, at the balance between acquiring the data um, and you know getting the accuracy and, and the precision that that you want or, or that you're comfortable with, we use RTK and and again uh, with a lot of our kit being being Trimble, we use the Trimble VRS network and um, that that is used as a kind of perhaps a bit of a shortcut to to try and um, improve your your accuracy and and certainly because we're looking at at relative accuracy, you know, in, in terms of the baseline, but also in terms of, of change year and year, we're happy with, with that. And, and I think we are taking that forward. Great. And I'd just say uh, we've got six Cherish newsletters behind us now over the project. And each one has a Cherish and Focus section on geophysics, on uh, paleo environmental sampling, uh, and also on other tech, drones especially. So if you search for Cherish newsletter online, you should pick up our past. Uh, copies and it's also available on our website. So do look for those. Uh, another couple of questions here. Uh, Helen Murray asks, when will these data sets be made available through portals? So again, we are uh, we're really looking at the probably the next three to six months for for the first data sets to to start coming through, uh, and it's it's all about about um, aligning that. So you know, currently there are some some data available. The uh, the vessel data that, that we have acquired um, from 2018, I think was the, the first survey that we did. That's available through the UK HO um, data portal because we we've, uh, provide that over in, in the UK. Um, the data is, is also available, that marine data is available through the, the Infomar um, data portals as, as well from, from the Irish section, some of the bays that, that we've done um, is, is available for download through that. And then the terrestrial stuff is in the process of, of going through, through the portal. So again, I have to say watch this space, but um, we would hope to get a lot of the, the UAV drone data out um, within the next six months start getting it out within the next six months. And again, as, as Toby has mentioned, um, look at the, the Sketchfab uh, three-dimensional models uh, for wh where you are able to kind of like manipulate and, and look at a, a model of some of the areas we've, uh, we studied. Excellent. Uh, we've got a couple of uh, final questions, I think, uh, uh, but uh, we may have another couple coming in as well. Uh, from Claire Gibbon. Um, given that there are so many elements to look at in measuring coastal change, uh, like inland conditions as well as marine, over how long a period does one have to make surveys to get useful enough information to protect against change or control it? Mm -hmm. um, very good question. And uh, you can kind of like, like <laughs> you can answer in a hard way, how long is a piece of string? Um, it's, it's very difficult to answer that, that question. Um, you know, to really understand the the long term change, you want to have long term records to to understand that, um, and and so that helps with the you know with the maps, the, the very accurate maps where, where we go back um, to the eighteen forties, where we got about one hundred and sixty um, year, years of change. But but you also have to be be very um, cognizant of. Uh, of those maps of you know one where they can be very accurate in in, in some areas and um, 
you know, places might not be surveyed that accurately? Are they measuring the, the top of a cliff versus the, the, the bottom of a cliff? Like what's being recorded and, and being mapped, which you're then comparing to, to today? You also have to be, be very aware of kind of like alignment issues when you're bringing in old stuff in, in, into new stuff. Um, in terms of our, the stuff that, that we're collecting now, you know, yes, I, I think, you know, uh, perhaps what the, the, the question that, that, that you're getting to, you know, Cherish is only six years long. Um, we will be able to, to record, we'll be able to monitor change. Um, we'll certainly be able to, to ascribe that change to weather events. But over the, the duration of, of Cherish, we won't be able to, to measure climate change, which, which is the, the long term change. But what we, we are really doing and, and we're really interested in is, is establishing that baseline and establishing that, that methodology for applying a baseline over wide areas from which over the, the next kind of like decades we'll be able to monitor and assess that, that long term change and uh, looking at coastal change and understanding coastal change is, is also understanding the the different scales they're happening both in terms of, of space so what happens over an entire coastline versus what happens in, in a particular bay uh, can change but also over time the, your, your your temporal scale so uh, one-off storm events can, can make big changes but then it's the the long-term um, collection of, of those which are, are feeding into your long-term change and and then that's your your climate change uh, so I, Claire I, I don't think I answered your, your question there but it's it, it's a difficult question to, you know it, it, it's a, it's a very real problem for people working in coastal areas is you know over how long uh, a time do you have to look over what kind of an area do you have to do you have to look and so we're really at the stage now and, and many places at the stage now where it's just just a establish the baseline and then we'll, we'll look at it from then. Now that's the thing, I think if you want to know, you know, the condition of the coastline in 1930 or in 1820 at the moment, the data is, you can't, it's not accurate enough to do more than guess within a, a few tens of metres. The, the thing is now we can bank this data for these study sites in Wales and Ireland, isn't it? And if you want to know why, what brain or head look like now in, in 100 years time, we're going to have that securely archived, fully accessible, uh, and even if the 3D models don't work, all that basic raw data that we gathered is still there to be re-engineered in the computers of 100 years' time. So, uh, you know, there, there's that long-term planning, isn't there? Mm -hmm. uh, another question we have uh, from Sarah Sherlock. Uh, will the OSI, or the Survey Island, use this data to revise the high water mark? Yes. Um, a, another good question. Um, I, I'll answer in that they... Uh, they could, um, you know, th th this data could could be used. And um, certainly, the the OSI work on, on a national scale, so that they would be very interested in, in establishing that the high water mark across the, the entire east coast, um, or you know, the entire coast of, of Ireland. And in fact, they, they actually did did a lot of work on on their their datum there a, a few years ago. Cherish being site specific, uh, we're really operating on, on a different scale to what the OSI would, would be interested in. So um, while the data could be used for that kind of, um, of, of a technique, um, I feel it, it won't be used. Um, but the, you know, the technologies that we are, are applying here, that the methodologies that, that we are applying are the kind of things that the OSI could then use and, and, and are applying in, in many circumstances to answer that, that question. And then could be used to maybe increase the, the frequency at which these are, are changed and, and altered as well in the face of a changing climate and the changing coastline. Excellent. Well, uh, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for all their questions. And um, we've had over 50 people watching tonight, which is absolutely remarkable, absolutely brilliant for, for this evening. And it, I, I can see that we've had people from both sides of the IRC as well, which is uh, a very good uh, sort of test for this sort of method, even though we're, it would have been nice to have this talk live uh, in the flesh in the library, uh, actually can reach such a wide audience through this technology. So thank you for your questions and thank you for your participation tonight. Uh, and I'd like to join in all together as thanking uh, uh, Kieran for giving us uh, a fantastic evening of new information, new data, fun models, only weeks old as well. So uh, from me, thank you very much indeed, Kieran. Uh, and on behalf of the Cherish Project and the partner organisations, I'd like to wish you all good evening. Thank you.